Glass Half Full with Avalon Lustig. Brought to you by the Amherst Wire. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Glass Half Full with Avalon Lustig. I am so excited for this week's topic because we are going to be talking about yoga. Yoga is one of my favorite ways to de-stress while getting a workout in. But for a newbie or someone uneducated on yoga, the thought can be intimidating considering there is a variety of different kinds of yoga or that you spend a part of the time in class upside down. Today, we are going to talk about different kinds of yoga, how it can help your well-being, and what it means to be a yogi. Yoga began over 5,000 years ago in the Indus Sarasvati civilization in northern India. It has persevered through time to still be practiced today. If the term yoga is the trunk of a great tree, its many branches represent all the different types of yoga. Today, we will go over a small portion of some of the more popular variations of yoga. The first type of yoga is Hatha yoga. Hatha yoga focuses on the physical aspect of yoga. Hatha yoga classes are at a slower speed, hold asanas, which are postures, and teaches alignment. Because poses are held longer, Hatha yoga helps to build strength in your muscles. So if you're looking to feel the burn, this is the class for you. Hatha yoga is a great class for beginners because of the slower pace. The second type of yoga is Bikram yoga. Bikram yoga is also known as hot yoga. In Bikram Yoga, the room is kept at a whopping 105 degrees. The heat promotes more sweat than usual to support the belief that extra sweat is a result of toxins leaving the body. The class follows a routine of 26 poses, which is great for anyone looking for a predictable class. Some things to consider with Bikram Yoga is that the heat lets your muscles become more flexible, so your body is at a higher risk of strain. If you attend this class, bring extra water to stay hydrated. Don't forget. Vinyasa yoga is all about intertwining your breath to movement. Cardio is a main aspect of vinyasa yoga. It can be faster paced and the continuous movement can make for a great cardiovascular workout. Because of this, vinyasa yoga, from my perspective, seems to be one of the more popular variations of yoga. Another type of yoga is Iyengar yoga. Iyengar yoga focuses on the fundamental alignment of your body. In this class, you use props like blocks or straps to help you focus on the position of your body. It is a great yoga for beginners because if you lack confidence in your flexibility, the props aid you. Poses are held for a long period of time, so if you're one of those individuals looking to feel the burn, this is another class that is just meant for you. The last yoga we are going to talk about is restorative yoga. If you're looking to just chill out and quiet the mind, this is the yoga for you. You use props like blocks, bolsters, and even blankets to support your body and guide you into a deeper meditation. It is a great way to de-stress and chill out. Basically, you're just laying down on your yoga mat like a big plop in the yoga studio, but it counts as exercise. While everymove.org only covers these types of yoga in their Yoga 101 article, there are so many more types of yoga to discover. A great interpretation of the power of yoga can be seen in Kevin Smith's upcoming movie, Yoga Hosers. The movie is about two girls who practice yoga a lot. In their class, they are taught that yoga can defeat any evil thing that comes their way. In the movie, evil little creatures come into their store and cause a ruckus. The two girls battle these creatures with yoga poses. I love the interpretation that yoga is seen as a superpower because in its own way, it is. Yoga helps combat many evil things in our lives like depression, stress, and anxiety. I think it really represents how powerful yoga can be in changing your life for the better. All you need to handle any situation in life are the warrior one and warrior two positions, girls. Master those, and you will master anyone who gives you sh**. Yoga becomes a political conversation as the term cultural appropriation enters the discourse. The foundation of yoga actually comes from the Hindu faith, which uses yoga as a religious practice. 
In S. E. Smith's article, Like It or Not, Yoga is a Textbook Example of Cultural Appropriation, Smith said, Yoga is intended to connect people with the divine. The asana are just one aspect of that practice. Along with the postures come breathwork, meditation, concentration, observances, withdrawal, restraints, and higher levels of meditation. These things are practiced as part of an interconnected system, and for some people, they are very integral to personal expressions of faith. On the contrary, Western yoga has become the it thing of Western culture. We have completely taken away the religious aspect of yoga, which is probably one of the most important parts to it. Western yoga has taken what they want from yoga to make it their own customized version, but still consider it the same. Smith also said, while many people appear uncomfortable when it comes to talking about cultural appropriation, yoga furnishes a textbook example. Westerners lift something from another tradition, brand it as exotic, proceed to dilute and twist it to satisfy their own desires, and then call it their own. While claiming to honor the centuries of tradition involved, what they practice is so far from the actual yoga practiced by actual Hindus that it's really just another form of trendy fitness covered in new age trappings. An issue with Western yoga is that there are some who benefit from another culture's religious practice. Here is Nisha Ahuja in her documentary, You Are Here, exploring yoga and the impacts of cultural appropriation. On a big macro level, who benefits? We can see corporations benefiting from um, yogic medicine and practice by turning it into something that's sellable. So there are yoga accessories, there are yoga mats, there are yoga towels, there is yoga clothing, there are whole fashion lines based on yoga. and. Are they really coming from a place that is traditionally um, supportive of a yogic practice? And if yogic practice is not necessarily about our exterior physical being, um, but has been turned into that, then are we moving away from a yogic practice? With this information, keep in mind that what you might be practicing is not what yoga is actually intended to be. Smith went on to say, in 2010, the Hindu American Foundation launched a Take Yoga Back campaign to address some of these issues, reaching out to educate people about the origins of yoga. Their campaign is designed not to tell people to stop practicing yoga, but to get people thinking about its roots. It's about time to wrap up this week's episode of Glass Half Full. There are two things that I hope you walk away with today after listening to this podcast. The first one is an inspiration to participate in yoga. Yoga is a great practice to invest your energy in for your body, your mind, and your spirituality. Hopefully with our crash course of yoga, you are more comfortable with trying something new. The next thing I hope you walk away with is the respect for yoga. Please keep in mind that it is a religious practice for some and it deserves just as much respect as other religious practices you're familiar with. Next time you're in yoga class, ask the teacher to teach the class about the roots of yoga, the importance of yoga, and what it actually means to be a yogi. Check out more awesome content on www.amherstwire.com and support UMass Amherst's journalism department. Stay tuned for next week's episode of Glass Half Full with Avalon Lustig. Thanks for listening.